Hello everyone, welcome back to Christian's Colloquy. I'm Christian and I'm so glad that you could join me again this week. Today we're doing a classic episode, we're diving into church history, and I'm going to be introducing a figure which I find interesting, which hopefully you will find interesting, and we will be discussing her not only this week, but then next week's episode we'll dive a bit into her work and talk a bit more about her literature and impact. So today, who are we talking about? Who is this figure? It's Phyllis Wheatley. And as you can see from the title, she was an enslaved individual who became a poet who is well known in American and English speaking literature, but also was an evangelical Christian of a great and inspiring spirituality. So anyway, today we're going to dive in who was Phyllis Wheatley. Wheatley was born around the year 1753. We're not sure the exact date, and we're not also sure the exact location. Likely she was born in present-day Gambia or Senegal, but could be anywhere in West Africa given the nature of her time and how she came to be in the New World. She was brought to Boston in 1761, and she came aboard the slave ship named Phyllis. You'll notice there we're speaking about Phyllis Wheatley, and her first name was taken from the slave ship in which she was brought to the, the New World to America upon. She was bought by a wealthy merchant named John, married to Susanna, and their last name was Wheatley. So here we see Phyllis Wheatley, her first name from the slave ship who took her to America. Her last name came from the people who purchased her. So, of course, she was a slave stolen from West Africa and then brought to the New World to serve uh, this white couple in America. The Wheatleys, though, were devout Congregationalists, and they were supporters of the great evangelical leader and Methodist George Whitfield. George Whitfield has come up a lot on the channel. He had this great and inspiring spirituality. He was a powerful preacher, one who was leading the evangelical revival, but also, as we know from last week's episode, he had an unfortunate track record when it came to not only slavery and slaveholding, but also pushing for slavery. However, it was under Mary Wheatley, one of the Wheatley's children, that Phyllis, uh, despite being a slave and living during the 18th century as a slave in America, she gained an extraordinary education in not only literature, but also history and, ever so importantly, Christian theology. So this was a unique circumstance and something we'll talk about and mention in a little bit. Phyllis Wheatley, though she was a slave, she was a favored domestic slave. So you think of a slave that was in the home, but also a slave that would receive a lot more attention, care, and appreciation than the vast majority of slaves in America during this time. Because of this education and just being afforded what she was afforded, she was able, Wheatley, to publish her first poem in 1767. This, of course, was due to the not only the generosity, but also the appreciation of her owners. It was during this time and shortly after this time that Phyllis Wheatley became known and famous for her poetry. And her poetry was well known eventually on both sides of the Atlantic in what we now know as America and Britain, because they reference Christian piety and all sorts of classical themes. Let's keep moving here. Wheatley, raised in this family that was uh, caught up in the evangelical revival, that first great awakening, she was baptized in a Congregationalist Church by Samuel C Cooper in 1771. So a Congregationalist tradition, not the exact same church she would have been raised in under the Wheatley family, but that same evangelical tradition. Wheatley, again, being raised in this tradition that was influenced by Whitfield, she actually came into contact with and was supported by Selina Hastings, the Countess of Huntington. Huntington, Selina, she was a well-known evangelical benefactor. She was someone who supported Methodist itinerant preachers like Whitfield. She had connections across the evangelical world, and she used her wealth as a countess with significant wealth to support evangelicals, whether they were ministers, poets, or even social activists. And given her evangelical spirituality, as we discussed, there's this interesting dynamic. Though Hastings wasn't opposed to slavery, she went out of her way to support enslaved Africans. Phyllis Wheatley would join a number of Afri African-born authors who were supported by the Countess of Huntington. So John Morant, James Albert, and someone we're familiar with on the channel, Odalau Equiano, these great African-born 
uh, sl enslaved or formerly enslaved writers. She would be so supportive of supported of them, and Wheatley would appreciate and experience that same support. Also unifying these African writers like Morant, Albert, Equiano, and now, of course, Wheatley, was their mutual appreciation of George, Whit George Whitfield's preaching, his ministry, and his spirituality. Again, thinking about last week's episode, this really complicates our understanding of evangelical history, not only in relation to slavery, but also abolition. George Whitfield, though he was notably one of the evangelical leaders who supported slavery, who even pushed for it, he was not one of those many, many evangelicals who actively opposed it and spoke out. Again, that was a main evangelical tenant for so many. Whitfield was a supporter of slavery, yet Whitfield specifically, by name, with full knowledge of this, still was appreciated and supported by so many more, so many African-born and formerly or currently enslaved individuals such as Wheatley, such as Equiano. They would name him and appreciate him by name. And likewise, and perhaps we'll discuss this next time when we look at Wheatley's some of her poems, is that another figure that we mentioned, Jonathan Edwards, who owns slaves, he was also by name, or not by name, but by subtle reference, appreciated by many of these African-born, formerly enslaved authors. That again complicates our picture, and we'll need to talk about that more. Wheatley, as a favored domestic slave, was emancipated in 1773. So this was before the end of slavery itself as an institution in both the British Empire and the 13 colonies, which we now know as America. She was freed by her owners, her freedom was purchased, and she became a free black woman in America. I encourage you, I'll leave a link in the description to the book that I read about her, her complete works, where you could get an interesting uh, discussion about how she related both to being a black woman in Britain during this time as she visited there, but also to her experience in Boston and what we know as America today. A little bit more to talk about. After her freedom, she married a John Peters, a free black man, in 1778. If I recall correctly, he was a grocer. And they would be married for some time, but that marriage was rocky. And unfortunately, Wheatley's three children with Peters all died young. So this marriage, it was hard for several reasons. One of those reasons was Wheatley's children all died young. And she herself, Phyllis Wheatley, she died on Sunday, December 5th in 1784. So that's the life, the general details of Phyllis Wheatley, but I just want to get us started to think about her impact a little bit more. Again, next time we'll dive into her poetry, talk about her legacy, especially how she related to Christian virtue and her experience with Africa and being an enslaved person. But right now I want to leave you with the following two quotes from the book that I read. Firstly, the literary quality of Wheatley's poetry, usually in combination with that of Sancho's letters, that being Ignatius Sancho, was frequently cited by opponents of slavery and the slave trade, especially in Britain, as evidence of the humanity and the inherent equality of Africans. So people who oppose slavery would point specifically to Wheatley's works alongside a few others to show, hey, Despite what people say about Africans being brutish, being savage, whatever terms and horrifying names they would call Africans to justify their slavery, abolitionists would point to Wheatley's works and say, look at this work. This is the product of someone who is smart, someone who is rational, who is clearly equal with us, no matter what they say. So her works were a prime example that Africans were capable as just as much as white Europeans if afforded the same opportunities. And in the case of Wheatley, she had to carve those out for herself. She had allies, but she had to really work at it. And she was able to demonstrate that Africans have given the chance. They could be great writers, great poets, and great whatever they set their minds to if they were afforded those opportunities. And that's what the abolition movement wanted to see happen. Great. Another quote. At the beginning of the 21st century, her place in the developing tradition of early transatlantic literature by people of African descent and her role as the mother of African American literature are secure. So Wheatley stands as a figure we should know, especially we're thinking in February, many of us about black history. Phyllis Wheatley stands as this mother of African-American literature. She not only was this brilliant mind that stood with the best, whether white or black, African or European during her time when it came to writing, 
but African Americans following after her, to this day you will still hear it, look up to Wheatley as someone who began their tradition of poetry, of literature, in the English language. So, we need to appreciate what Phyllis Wheatley stood for in the 18th century as a prime example of Africans' humanity and their abilities and their capabilities, which many Europeans were refusing to recognize and were holding them back through slavery at the time. So we need to appreciate her context and her work there, but we also need to begin to think about her legacy. Many African Americans, women, men, poets, essayists, whoever else, they would look back to Wheatley as an example, as an encouragement, and as someone who began their movement of liter literary excellence. Anyway, that's who Phyllis Wheatley is. That's a bit of her legacy. I hope that you will join me next time when we look at at least two of her poems that speak not only to her history, her personal history coming out of Africa, but also how she felt about the Christian religion and specifically the virtue of being virtuous. Anyway, that's it for now. I look forward to seeing you next time. Take care.